good evening everyone i'm nitin uh, i currently work in ericsson global services as a senior data scientist so i have an experience of 7 years in detail domain as well as now i'm working in telecom domain so i have been working on time series analysis linear models non linear models and uh, now deep learning as well so uh, allow me to share my screen and then probably we can start with the session okay so uh, as uh, all of us are working in uh, data science domain or we are aspiring to work in data science domain so as the with the pace of development uh, currently the simpler models have been replaced by uh, non linear models and then uh, deep learning models as well and uh, how these complex models help us is it they try to uh reduce the amount of time a data scientist usually spend or used to spend in feature engineering job and eda jobs so but to explain the data to the customer or get the sense of data how the data is moving and how the output is moving from uh, it is being derived from the input it is very important to do a proper set of eda and then also to and also try to make or make an explanation how input can be uh, altering the output it can be done mathematically as well and it can be done graphically as well for which we use eda so uh deep learning uh, i also work on deep learning but uh, when it comes to explaining deep learning models uh, to customers then uh, it causes a problem because most of the deep learning mo models act as a black box so if you go and try to explain your deep learning models to a customer who has no or very less information about machine learning and how the thing is or uh, the thing is getting uh, automated let's say automated it will uh, Uh, it will be very difficult for a normal data scientist to explain how a data a deep learning model is working with your with the customer's huge data and then uh, giving some some amount of recommendation or some amount of insight from that data so uh, <clears throat> but but for all not for all the problems but for some problems these simple uh, linear models uh they can also beat uh, a very complex deep learning model uh just by doing some tricks and yes uh, i think i think someone raised the hand now <clears throat> uh i was uh, yeah so simple linear models along with uh, feature engineering uh most of the problem, many of the non linear problems can also be solved using feature engineering and simple linear models feature engineering when we say feature engineering feature engineering is not not just doing some transformations uh, on the data that is already present i mean that is also part of feature engineering like doing some standardization of the data or doing some uh, or making some uh, distribution uh, from the data or scaling the data but feature engineering is also adding different features to your uh, already present data based on the mathematics around it and whatever use case you are working on so the meaning of data should also be very clear to the data scientist who is working on the data so the topics that we will be covering uh, currently it will be uh, first we'll discuss the exor problem it's a very common problem in uh, machine learning uh, machine learning uh, field it's a very good common non linear problem which generally is solved by uh, <clears throat> using non linear tree based model so we'll be discussing that then i'll be showing some tricks uh, for the time series analysis uh, that we follow in uh, ericsson and other way also uh, can, can you please mute whoever is playing that music yeah yeah uh then i'll be discussing some tricks uh from sklearn and other libraries that can be used for uh, regression problems and 
uh, as as feature in fe uh, as new features, and then we'll be doing a uh, doing some discussion around uh, how using these simple models is better uh, <clears throat> in many cases versus uh, a deep learning model. So starting with the XOR problem. So uh, an XOR problem look like looks like this. Uh, if I zoom it out more, so generally the data set. Uh, XOR problems are around uh, classification only. So there are two classes of data sets. One is red, one is blue. <clears throat> the blue one generally passes from uh, the red one. So currently I've just discussed the brief introduction of this, how the session will go on uh, and what, what are the things that we'll be covering uh, in this session. <clears throat> so we were starting from the XOR problem. So yes, so as you see in the figure, as you see in the figure, this is a basic XOR problem. XOR problem is when there are uh, when there are two classes and all both the classes have uh, different. <clears throat> so one class is passing from another class. So if you go with this X1 and X2 features, these X1 and X2 features, you will get a plot something like this. And the problem comes, uh, the problem statement is that we have to make a model to classify red dots and green dots. So the go-to approach will be some for someone will be that, okay, this is not a linear thing. It cannot be separated by a single piece of line or any linear model can't separate this because it is not visually uh, being separated. So <clears throat> the, we, we go with nonlinear model, a tree based model, or maybe a neural network. If we apply feature engineering technique and we try to, and if we create just one more feature and add it to the same data set by doing X1 uh, into X2, and then we use this X3 as well in the, uh, in the data set, and then we apply a linear model. Then in the three dimension linear model, the 2D plane that will be separating the, these points will actually give you a more uh, clean, cleaner slice of green dots and the red dots. So simpler models, due to their simplicity, we need more features to be added and more relevant features to be added using fe good feature engineering techniques so that the model can understand the data better and <clears throat> give you better results. But yes, they, they will be explainable and uh, yeah, and they will be easier to fix as well if something goes wrong. Uh, some more, uh, yeah, this is for some more tricks that we use. So in uh, uh, in my current company, as well as my last company, uh, we used to work a lot with time series models. So sure, uh, I'm zooming in more. Uh, okay, so we used to work a lot with the time series model. We, most of the problems were like uh, explain. So we are giving, we are given uh, sales uh, of let's say five to 10 years and we have to predict the sale of uh, next one year or next one quarter uh, of different categories, different SQs. Uh, in telecom also, in Ericsson also, we are doing this, uh, but in telecom we do this mostly for the demand. That whether the demand of a particular mobile uh, network will increase uh, in this particular month or in this particular quarter or not. So generally the time series uh, model looks looks like this only. <clears throat> so the if you go if you go by a non-linear model, then it will be very difficult uh, for us to explain this that how we are tr we are trying to forecast uh, our time series. What what are the key features that are being considered? Uh, <clears throat> how many months of data is related to the next coming week or next coming month. So these are, these are the features that our customers are also interested to know so that they can also work uh, more on those lines and improve their, uh, improve their, let's say customer performance or sales or uh, other KPIs. So linear models play a very good role here as well. And to, uh, deploy a linear model for time series, we need a lot of feature engineering. So if you can see, there is a, a, a seasonal pattern here. Uh, 
the demand is going up uh, in few months and coming down in few months <clears throat> and this pattern continues over the year so there are trend there are uh, seasonality there is uh, other feature which is known as uh, uh, auto regressiveness so all those features they come into play in linear models <clears throat> these are some tricks that we uh, that we use to incorporate all the traditional features that uh, a linear model can provide us but there uh, there's always some uh, additional things left which are to be catered to increase the performance of our models like this is uh, this is called radial function <clears throat> or uh, we we also call it yearly hump so yearly hump what yearly humps does is let's say this is uh, this is my uh, time series that i that i'm trying to forecast the green part is my uh, training part and the red part is my test part so as you can see in the starting in uh, in the starting of the year the we are having a positive trend <clears throat> the demand is increasing and then the demand is gradually decreasing towards april and then increasing further and then going down towards the end of the year so if i go with a linear model and i'll try to fit a linear line on this <coughs> it will try to fit <coughs> all these data points on the single line so to in uh, so to so to add a a a, a new feature here uh, by this time series it helps us to uh, reduce the error that we, that we get uh, from adding uh, I mean, it helps to reduce the error of the linear model, uh, which is trying to predict all these data points in for for let's say one year or one week or one uh, quarter. Similarly, this uh, function can be altered. <clears throat> this function can be altered for uh, monthly as well as weekly uh, duration. So there will be uh, these. Uh, uh, yes. So. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, questions can be uh, answered at the end as well as in the Q and A section. So, yeah. So it's another trick that we use is let's say there is some uh, festival, and we see a sudden drop in the sales or sudden drop in the demand. <clears throat> then we up, try to give this this kind of wave there as a as a separate uh, feature. So that when we were we are trying to forecast, when we are trying to forecast that particular uh, point of time, <clears throat> it should have something which is different from the other time other data points, because we know that there is an event there. That's why it will have something something different, behave, somewhat different behavior than the other data points. So these kind of waveforms they help us to in uh, to increase or decrease the <clears throat> i mean to differentiate the model the uh, model behavior for specific data points so to model these kind of waveforms uh once once you get the when once you get the hang of it then it becomes easier that let's say here it's valentine's day so the so the sales for a particular maybe particular kind of uh product increases around valentine's day so in the sales also you will see a peak there but it can't be explained over the whole year it it can just be explained in the week of that valentine's day i mean the valentine's week so that's why these kind of waves help <coughs> helps us for explaining the for explaining the uh, impact of certain events certain uh, festivals and certain uh, let's say holidays as well sometimes holidays as well yes then uh, there can also be skewness in the different seasons let's say the impact of season is increase uh, i mean the impact of something is increasing season by season and there's a skewness around it if you if you see the uh, the test part is slightly although they are having the same shape but <clears throat> the amplitude of the waves have uh, altered so these skewness can also be in this skewness can also be catered with you using uh, 
certain features we can uh, reduce the amplitude by maintaining the shape and then it can be used with uh, uh, the linear model itself now with uh, there are some tricks with sklearn that we use uh, so <clears throat> while working with regression problems uh, we have we come across uh, many situations when there is uh, when there is an uh, in when there is a we can see that there that the behavior of the data point is different for different for some uh, for some let's say we have we are only having the numerical data and we can see that some data points are behaving in a certain region and others are behaving in a certain region so here what we try to do is we try to do a pre clustering or a profiling <clears throat> kind of a thing and then incorporate another uh, and then on those clusters we try to do the regression thing what it helps in such a way that uh, Uh, yes, for time series forecasting, Arima and Charima are used. Arima and Charima are also linear models. Uh, I can see a question. So they are also linear models. Uh, they are in the OLS library. So they take care of your auto regression and uh, Charima take care of, of seasonality as well. So yes, we use Arima and Charima, but uh, normal linear model can also be used with a uh, Bayesian interface. So, yes. So, when we do a pre-clustering on linear regression, before linear regression, and then on the resultant clusters, we apply uh, a linear model, then it helps us because the line that is to be fit on the data, it is <clears throat> having a little lesser amount of variance in the data points and the fit can be increased in a much better way. So there will be multiple linear regression models, but they will fit your data in a better way because if you try to fit a single line between these red dots and these green dots, you will surely have a better, you will surely have a more error uh, and the performance will also be not good. So Escalon <clears throat> and other libraries, they help in a way that you can introduce you can try to segregate your data for before applying it in regression and then uh, they can be used uh, another technique that we use is uh, in telecom we have a lot of time series uh, every site is emitting signal at all the time and all that data is coming to us as time series so let's say we have to forecast <coughs> Uh, let's say we have to forecast uh, on which particular sites the uh, the traffic will increase in uh, next week or next month and so that uh, more equipments can be supplied on those sites to avoid any kind of outage because in telecom any kind of outage is uh, <clears throat> any kind of outage can be uh, very very uh, you know, problem problematic. So in uh, telecom, how we do uh, clustering is, so we try to cluster the sites based on their traffic signatures. Traffic pattern is uh, traffic pattern. You can understand traffic pattern by uh, the number of users that are uh, present in a particular site's vicinity. So we try to cluster the sites based on their traffic pattern across the whole day. If you see in the X axis, it is uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, as in zero hour of the day and the zeroth minute. So <clears throat> all the sites which are having the similar traffic pattern across the day, they should be, they should get clustered in the same cluster. Then that cluster can be further used for analysis and uh, demand forecasting. So this is this can also be done using a min max scaling from a scalar and then applying a k means or any distance based clustering and it will give you good results. <clears throat> Just not use uh, 
the absolute value of the well uh, absolute value of the uh, time series use a scaled value if all the values are having are on the same scale then it gives a gives much better results uh, than the absolute value now uh, the nicer properties uh, so uh, linear models uh, fueled with feature engineering they are pretty straightforward if something breaks uh, most of the people who are working can fix it uh, not you are always not required to be present there so and they these these functions that i have shown or uh, these are so simple that they can be created in excel to java to python they can be ported to any language and they can be created and uh, fed into the uh, your original data <clears throat> for customer also understanding linear logics and mathematics around them it is simpler very very simpler compared to ans and cnns uh, that are used if someone is familiar with bayesian estimators the bayesian estimator work best with uh, linear models and bayesian uh, most most of the market mix modeling uh, approaches they are working around bayesian estimators also because uh you have full control on the roi that will be reported at the end of the solution <coughs> so and in the in the end it makes it helps you make a solution which is easier than the problem for for the explaining part so you your solution should be easier to be easier to be understand and uh <coughs> it should it should also try to picture the problem that okay this solution is solving this problem so i need to understand the pro i need to understand the solution to in in order to picture how the solution will be able to solve this problem the next uh, thing productionizing the pr productionizing simple models is ob obviously it's easier uh, as i told earlier that if something gets uh, if something gets uh, hung or if something gets uh, yes uh, if something uh, breaks in the production uh, and if it's a complex model and no one other than you can fix it uh, then it will be a problem for you you can't be present everywhere <clears throat> and also once the production i think is done it generally the model go to a legacy uh, to a team which handles the legacy uh, models so it's it's better if the feature engineering part is done uh, carefully and a simplistic approach is used to solve the problem because <clears throat> it will it will help it will help you do more work and uh, also the problem will also be fixed if any problem occurs uh yes so now we can take up the questions uh simple models allow you to explain how the solution was reached based on the solution so you can you can post uh, your questions uh, in the chat or maybe directly to me on my profile and we can take those up uh referencing simple models allow you to explain how the solution was reached yes simple models uh, allow us to explain how the solution was reached but as well as uh, if if the simple model is working then why <clears throat> why should we go to a complex model the i i don't think most i don't think many of the cases a complex model is required if the feature engineering part and the idea part is done <coughs> uh, properly so shubham is asking in which case we can go with ann or deep learning model other than than ml algos so uh, okay so ann or deep learning model so let's say <clears throat> uh 
uh, your uh, so if you have tried everything every feature engineering technique that you know and still you're not getting a satisfactory result then you can go to a complex model but the point here is uh, that uh, if you if you try to make something with a simple model and with uh, better features so every model is garbage and garbage out if you give good information to a model it will result in better results if those results also are not uh, as per your uh, let's say acceptance criteria then you should move, then you should also then you should always move to a more complex model because a, how it happens is if you go to if you are going to a complex model the amount of work that you are required to do in feature engineering will reduce so that's why generally people go to uh, complex models because in in multi dimension you can't also do feature engineering in fewer dimensions it is possible to think of something to do a feature engineering thing and then apply a simpler model if that if the dimensions are increasing then it will be very difficult for you so in those cases you should move to a complex model and it will help you certainly to reach your acceptance criteria uh, i hope i was able to answer uh, your question